from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Today, I am so very, very, very honored to be introducing Kia Dupree today. So, I'm going to be very short and, um, and letting you know a little bit about her, but also from the heart to let you know that I too was born and raised in Washington, D.C., Southeast Washington, D.C. I too wonder why when people walk by those grand row houses that they don't wonder what is the family kinship inside those walls? Can those walls speak and tell about the soul, the love, the power that exists in those homes? And what about Bebe's house down the street on Minnesota Avenue? Or are we going over to Ray Ray's house over on Good Hope Road? I too understand it and I cannot tell you emphatically enough how proud we are to have you here. Kia Dupree grew up in Southeast Washington, D.C., in one of the poorest areas of the city with her mom, six of her seven brothers, and one of her two sisters. Yes, she comes from a big family, but it is from this very background where Kia pulls many of her story ideas. With a professional background as a college English instructor and assistant editor, an assistant editor, Put my glasses on. <laughs> An assistant editor, she loves to explore the complex relationships between families in her writings. She received the Fiction Honor Book Award from the Black Caucus of American Library Association for her debut novel, Robbing Peter, in 2005, a story whose theme centers around fatherless households. Kia's short story, Lost One was included in the Essence best-selling anthology, Hood to Hood, in 2008. She received a Bachelor of Arts degree in Mass Media Arts from Hampton University and a Master of Arts degree in English from Old Dominion University and a Professional Studies Publishing Certificate from New York University. Kia also has published a book entitled Damaged the first book with Grand Central Publishing, and that is to be followed by a very new book that is to drop, I read that on your page, <laughs> to drop, entitled Silenced um, this October, next month. Kia lives in Washington, D.C. with her family. I also like to let you know that I think this is what Silenced is going to look like. And I also like to let you know that her book, At Least Damage, is sold in Barnes & Noble tent. I, from the heart and with honor and very proudly, give to you Washington's own Kia Dupree. Hello, everyone. Um, Yes, I was born and raised in Washington, D.C., um, east of the river. Uh, so I do have a lot of stories that um, I share that relates to some of the trials and tribulations of people who grow up in that area. It's also on um, any all the areas in D.C. where people are struggling. Um, I'll be honest when I say I'm a little nervous. <laughs> Uh, one thing that Sabrina uh, probably didn't know is that I actually teach English to middle school kids at a charter school in D.C. So I take reading very, very seriously because it's reading that actually provided me a place of escape when I was growing up in a crowded house. Um, it was the way in which I was able to escape, you know, some of the negative things that I saw in my household, some of the negative things that I saw in my neighborhoods. So I always encourage all of my students to pick up anything and just read and let your mind just run free. Uh, let's see. I want to start by reading a little bit of Damaged so that you guys can get a taste of the sort of writing that I do. It has been characterized as urban fiction, which I wear that title, but I feel like any story that takes place in an urban environment and that isn't true is considered urban fiction. Uh, I like to say that I'm a truth teller, 
even though it's fiction, but I try to tell true stories of people that um, have developed in my mind who have, uh, who are actually descendants of real people. So um, just to give you a little taste, Damage is the story of a young girl who um, was molested by her foster father. And I was inspired to write a story about a girl who was molested because at the time I had a young teenage sister who I, who was not molested, not to my knowledge, but who was living a very um, unusual lifestyle. Wasn't as bad as Camille, but I think that because she had a strong support system that we were able to steer her on a right path. But I wonder, where would she be had she not had a strong support system? And that is sort of where Camille came from. At the same time, I had watched a documentary on HBO about some young teenage prostitutes in today's um, environment. And I, I, I was horrified at how this was happening. It wasn't the standard pimp with the cane and the hat twisted to the side, but it was young uh, minority boys who were just a few years older than them who happened to have a vehicle and who in some odd way was able to provide them with hope. Uh, and that's sort of where Camille came from. Um, so I'll just read a little bit. If you have the book, I'm going to read from <clears throat> page 37. This is a scene where Camille is um, in her foster home, and her best friend at the time is her foster brother, Jason. The next day, Jason sat in my room, teasing me about the new hairstyle I was rocking. He said I looked like a brown Raggedy Ann baby doll with my new micro mini braids. I had a few blonde streaks in the front like all the girls in high school had it too. I blinked my fake lashes that made me look even more like Bambi. Hell, I knew I looked hot. Shoot, I'd even be jealous of me if it wasn't me, if I wasn't me. I couldn't wait until Chu saw it. Mama said it looks too grown, but whatever, I love it, I said looking in the mirror. Yeah, it looks all right. It accentuates your high cheekbones, your spindle neck, and your ethereal beauty, Jason said in his fake British accent, trying to be funny. I can't believe Daddy ain't say nothing about it yet. He ain't going to care, trust. Let me grease your pots, Jason said. He picked up a few of my braids and pulled them away from my face real gentle-like because he knew they were still tight at the roots. Hand me the Kimmy oil, he said. I grabbed the oil off the dresser, but before I could give it to him, Mr. Big walked past the door and started going ballistic. I always knew you were an effing faggot, he yelled, grabbing Jason by the neck and pressing him up against my bedroom wall. I never heard Mr. Big cuss before, and even as mad as he got, I never seen him that mad. Tears was falling from Jason's eyes while he did his best to push Mr. Big off of him. But even though Jason was just as big as his father, he still was no competition. Miss Brinkley came running upstairs like the house was on fire, but she ain't do a thing to stop Mr. Big. She just stood in the doorway, rubbing the back of her neck and saying, sweet Jesus, over and over again. Daddy, I beg, please stop. Jason was gasping for air. He had quit fighting Mr. Big off and his feet wasn't touching the floor anymore. You're killing him, Daddy. M Mama, please, I screamed, do something. I turned to Miss Brinkley, who looked like an animal caught in a trap but she was shaking and squeezing her cross necklace. Please, mama, you can't let daddy do this to him, I yelled. She paced the room as if she ain't know what to do. But me, my arms was in the air, then by my side, then out in front of me, reaching for Mr. Big. I'ma go call the police if you don't get off of him, I yelled, pushing Mr. Big as hard as I could. Foam had started falling from the crack of Jason's mouth and I got real scared. Get off of him, I yelled, pushing Mr. Big again. He ain't even blinked, so I jumped on his back and wrapped my arms around his neck. Frank, Frank, let my son go, Miss Brinkley yelled like she just snapped out of it. Let him go, Frank. Daddy, please, I screamed. He wasn't doing nothing wrong. Faggot, he said before letting Jason loose. Jason gagged a few times, trying his best to catch his breath, and then he hollered real loud before kicking the wall three times. He ran down the stairs and out the front door without looking back. 
I ran behind him and ain't care what trouble I might get in for leaving the house without permission. I just wanted to check on my brother. When I finally found Jason down the street, standing in front of the corner store, I ain't know what to say. I ain't know if he was gay. I never asked him. Hell, I ain't really care. I guess with Danica gone, I just felt like Jason was taking her place. All the questions I used to ask her, I just started asking him. He got me, just like Danica did, and he was comfortable around me, like I was around him. That's all I care, cared about. Jason was splitting a cigar open with his fingernails. I watched him let the middle stuff fall to the ground, and then I followed him as he walked away. We walked together without saying nothing to each other for a long time. We stopped in the big park at the bottom of the hill, right underneath a big tree. There was a broken down bench with a piece of wood on the back part missing. Jason sat on top of it with his feet on the seat and I leaned against the tree. I ain't noticed until now that his eyes was bloodshot. I shook my head knowing Mr. Big made that happen to him. Jason took out a tiny plastic bag filled with light green grass and carefully evened it out on the cigar skin. What you about to do, I finally asked. Roll up. That's weed. Yep. We gonna get high, 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 high. He's saying before licking and twisting the cigar. You acting like you ain't never heard of weed before. I had heard of it like in rap songs and stuff, but I ain't never seen it in real life. I mean, I saw the big leafy thing on people's t-shirts and on necklace charms and tattoos, but I ain't never seen it look like that. It really did look like weeds, green ones, except they was chopped up and stuck together with seeds in it. You wanna smoke some? Am I gonna go crazy or anything like that? Jason laughed and then he took a lighter and ran the flame across the sides of the cigar before lighting the tip and then inhaling it deep until a big curl of smoke blew from his lips. The smell was different than anything I ever smelled before. Not that it was a bad smell, it just ain't smell like cigarettes or cigars. The scent was strong and thick. It seemed like it was all over the park, in the trees, in the grass, and in the sky. After he pulled on it two more times, he passed it over without even looking at me. I put the cigar up to my lips and tried to do like I saw him do, but I couldn't make a long curl of smoke like he did. My nostrils was burning something terrible, too. Jason said, you got to pull on it till you feel a funny feeling, and then you hold it in your chest for like two seconds, then blow it out. Easy peasy. I tried again. This time when I did it, my face got numb, and I felt like my toes was twinkling like stars. I laughed and then pulled on it again, this time longer. The light from the tip lit up bright orange, and then I started choking. Camille, put your arms up over your head, Jason said, laughing. I laughed and coughed until tears ran down my face, and then I raised my arms up, letting air fill my lungs again. We smoked the whole cigar, which he called a blunt, until it was smaller than my fingernails. Well, Jason smoked it when it got to that size. It was too tiny for me. I thought I was going to burn my lips. Remember that day when I caught Jacqui and Danica doing it in the laundry room, Jason asked laughing? I laughed because Danica told me Jason had changed his voice like he was Mr. Big, and Jacquee damn near passed out after he bumped his head running into the wall. He was so busy rushing to put his clothes back on. No, you should have seen how he tried to fit her in that little space beside the washing machine. He had her looking like a New York pretzel, Jason said. I miss that girl so much. Me too. She used to hook me up, make sure I ain't leave out the house looking like a Bama, I said laughing. Well, hate to say it, but sometimes you still did, he said, joining on me. Boy, whatever, I said, shoving his thigh. We sat quiet for a while. I knew what he was thinking about, but I wasn't going to bring it up. That man just tried to kill me, he said, shaking his head. Can you believe it? Nah, I said, putting my head in my hands as I leaned on my knees. But I could believe it. He did things to me at least once a week that I never thought was supposed to happen to a girl who tried her best to be good. If Mr. Big thought his own flesh and blood, his baby boy, was a faggy, then he was probably going to do a whole lot worse if he knew for sure that he was. I'm not gay, Camille, Jason said, like he knew I was thinking it. Okay, I believe you, but I really don't care if you is. Just because I like some of the stuff I do don't make me gay. Jason, I said I believe you, Dad. He looked at his watch and then said, 
we should start heading back before, the cha before they change the lock. I laughed and then gave him my hand so I could pull him off the bench. Let's take a long walk around the park after dark. Jason sang a line from one of Jill Scott's songs and I smiled. We were both high, high, high. Find a spot for us to spark. I added another line. Oh, now you know about that, Jason said, surprised. Better not tell nobody but God. I giggled and held his hand as we walked back up the long hill. I ain't care if he was gay or not. I just, I was just glad he was my friend, even though I still hadn't told him my secret. Maybe that day would come. Thank you. Um, I guess the reason why I wanted to write that part is because I wanted to show how uh, peer pressure can happen. Um, Camille was already dealing with some um, issues that she was having a hard time sleeping with at night. And not only am I showing um, her being supportive of her foster brother, but you also see how she's becoming introduced to um, medicinal drugs. And she's feeling like, OK, it's OK for me to do this because my brother's doing it. And perhaps this is going to take us down a path where you see her feeling more OK to follow someone else's lead. Um, at the time in this book, when this is occurring, I want to say she's 12. So um, she's very influ you know, impressionable. And you can see how little things are starting to um, make her evolve into a new character. I'm going to fast forward a little bit to when she is a little older. In the story, um, she meets a guy named Chu who um, is really sweet to her and who, um, provide, unlike me, instead of books, he provides an escape for her to get out of her home and he happens to sell drugs on the side. So um, that's how he's able to take care of her a little bit. She depends on Chu a lot because um, it's sort of like a, a way for her to uh, get away from the craziness that's going on in her house because her foster parents are very religious and um, even being very religious, her foster father does molest her. Chu doesn't know about it, but he does know that she um, keeps up a wall. I am going to fast forward to, let's see, page 115, which is about three years later. African accents bounced off the dingy walls of the hair braiding shop at the corner of 8th and 8th Streets. I was getting Senegalese twists, but I hated when they spoke that stuff. Couldn't nobody understand but them. I tried thinking about Chu's mother and what she said about Africans, but I just thought what they was doing was rude. I looked around at the five other girls leaning to the left and then the right as the African ladies tugged and stitched fake hair extensions tightly on their heads. The braiders' dark, rough fingertips was cracked and peeling like they had been scrubbing floors with their bare hands. Strands of hair floated through the air, landing on any and everything. Hair was clogged in vents, wrapped around ankles, and even under my clothes. I knew some might be in my damn panties, too. Don't even ask me how it gets all the way down there. I was lucky enough to get a chair at 6 in the morning since it took five hours to do the style I wanted and, on, and I only made my appointment the day before. Chu was out of town driving Rob down to Greensboro since he had to move, sorry, since he had to move into the athletic dorm at A&T's a couple days earlier than the other college kids. I was trying my best to stay out of the house while he was gone, but it wasn't like I could have went down North Carolina with them. Chu and Rob was too busy building a little hustle down there with Smurf. Chep was about to get out in a couple months, so a lot of stuff was about to pop off for them. Just as the lady doing my hair reached for another pinch of the sandy brown synthetic weave I wanted added for streaks, the front door swung open. 
in walks Shakira, looking like a slut, with some super short booty shorts, a yellow tank top with the word superstar written in black glitter, and her stiletto sandals. It was way too early for all that extra. I ain't seen her in a minute, not since Ebony Fire, and she looked real different, like she'd been there and back again. She had a few scars on her face that ain't used to be there, and her lip looked a little swollen. She was carrying a bag of blonde hair extensions that was oozing out of her plastic bag. Can I get some micro mini, she said to one of the braiders sitting on a stool gossiping in the front of the store. How long you want, the African lady asked. To here, Shakira pointed to the middle of her back. $275, the woman said. Psst, you crazy, Shakira said, and then turned to leave. And I brought my own hair? Nah, I just go to the African Hair Gallery up in Silver Spring. 250, the lady called to her back. 225, Shakira said, stopping in her tracks and turning around. And I don't want two people doing my hair at the same time, neither. That stuff don't never look right. The lady sucked her teeth and said something in her crazy sounding language, and then the other Africans laughed, but kept their eyes locked on the scalps of their customers. Shakira put her hand on her hip and eyed the lady who twisted her lips up and pointed to the empty chair next to me. As soon as Shakira recognized me, she rolled her eyes before dropping her body into the spinning chair. No, that trick ain't just roll her eyes at me like I'll give a kitty that we still don't speak. I watched as some girls came in and out making appointments and getting loose braids replatted back in. A couple mothers dropped by to feed their hungry children who had been sitting in the same seat for hours. Men walked through the door too, boyfriends and husbands who needed to pay up for the hairstyles that cost anywhere from $150 to $500 depending on what the women got. I was almost done, except for the ends. The lady still needed to burn them off to seal the tips, but just as she was running the sizzling flame over the, the synthetic hair, melting them down, the front door burst open with a loud thud, hitting the wall. A skinny man, wearing a black baseball cap and a blue bandana over his nose and mouth, tightened his grip on the black gun in his hand. Two ladies screamed out, making everybody look at the door. Y'all shut the F up and get on the floor, the man yelled. He was shaking worse than some of us. Oh my God, Shakira hollered. I said shut the F up. Now get on the floor, all of y'all, he shouted, pointing the gun at her. I watched the man scan the room with his eyes as everybody jumped to the floor, and then he told one of the hair braiders who was sitting, who was sitting to get up. Get over here, Nefertiti, he yelled. I laid my head on the dirty floor and waited for whatever was going to happen next. Some of the women was crying and saying prayers. The slender lady wearing a turquoise hair wrap flinched as he pointed the gun in her direction. Give me all the money, all the money, he yelled at the top of his lungs. He was scratching and sweating. I was scared and wished Chu was here. Hurry up, the man yelled. I could hear the lady running around the shop and the sound of her flip-flops smacking the floor. I could tell the guy was high on some white because he kept scratching his arms and was real hyped up. He was behind the lady every single step of the way. Yeah, yeah, he yelled. I knew y'all kept a lot of cash in here. One of the women screamed something in African and the man said, shut up. I want the money from all the Americans in here too. Get it for me, Nefertiti. The woman was crying with this when she came to get the money I had. I'm scared, I heard Shakira mumble beside me. Me too, I admitted. All right, now everybody take your bottoms off. I want all bottoms, pants, skirts, dresses if you in them. And I want big drawers and little drawers. I want them all, the man yelled. A few gas went up in the air. One lady cried out like someone had just died. And then skinny man yelled, now take them off. To make his point clear, he shot, off, he shot off around in the ceiling. Everybody started jumping around and snatching their clothes off. Some people cried aloud. I pulled down my jeans and Shakira tore off her shorts. Hurry up, give it here, get all of them, skinny man said as the African lady with the head wrap gathered, gathered everybody's stuff. Hurry up, he yelled again. We huddled up, hiding our private parts while skinny man backed out the door. I watched the door for a few seconds before I realized that the man was really gone. Everybody ran around the store in circles. The Africans took their hair wraps off and wrapped them around their waist. Everybody else looked for other things to use, plastic bags with fake hair in it or hair magazines. Come on, Camille, let's get out of here, Shakira shouted. Oh my God, I can't believe this just happened. I yelled, fumbling for my phone. 
The crackhead was so worried about taking our bottles and the cash that he ain't even take our purses. I was gonna call Chew or Peaches, somebody. Let's go, Camille. I can't go out there like this. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'ma call my cousin Martha. She lived right around the corner, Shakira said, digging her cell phone from her purse. By the time Shakira's cousin finally came with shorts for both of us, someone had called the police and they was passing out yellow plastic blankets for everybody. We answered a few questions, gave a description of Skinny Man, and then we left the store. Girl, Shakira said, shaking her head, I can't believe that mess. Me either, I said. Um, I guess when I write, I try to think about uh, all the real things that happen. And anybody who knows me knows that I love the news. I used to work for a newspaper in Virginia. I always want to be the first person to know and the first person to tell other people. I'm nosy, that's who I am by nature. I, I like knowing stuff. And when I see wild stuff happening in the news, I'm always fixated with it because I can't believe human nature sometimes, like the things that people will do, especially when they're in a desperate situation. And um, having been a person who would sit for eight to 10 hours, getting my hair braided, um, wasting my life away for 10 hours, a lot of thoughts go in your mind. You're sitting there and you're watching people come in and out. And then you're watching that there's a monitor that's up in the corner that's pointed at you. And then you're thinking, why is there a monitor in the corner of the store pointed at me? Why is it that I have to be buzzed in in order to get my hair done like I'm at a bank or something? And then it dawned on me, they don't take credit cards here. They have a lot of cash here. And then this is where this thought of someone actually breaking into the shop and robbing the place came in my mind. That little scene actually started off as a little short story that I wrote that I later infused into the story. I do that a lot. Sometimes I see scenes where, um, for example, I'll see a whole bunch of furniture sitting outside of a place and wondering what's the story with that furniture? Who did it belong to? Um, sometimes I'll see people walking, looking sad, and making up in my head what they might have just heard. For example, in my new book, Silence, which comes out in two weeks, again, it's a story of another young girl. Um, and it's about, it's about a number of things. It's about her relationship with her mom, which is strained. And it's also about how DC has evolved over the past five years. Seeing as though I grew up here and have lived in other states, when I come back home and I see the um, abundant changes that's happening, I can't help but to reflect on what I see. I lived in Sursum Quarters. I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with that project neighborhood, but I remember being a senior in high school and up for a scholarship and they asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up and they asked me what was life like for me and I remember telling them that I could look out of my bedroom window in certain quarters and see the tippy top of the Capitol Dome in my view but look down and see somebody selling drugs and I remember bringing the people in that room to tears because we live in a society where that sort of thing can happen. At the same time, my heart broke when I found out that they were trying to tear down the neighborhood. Um, when I drive pa past First and K, I look around and I see that all the other surrounding communities around Sursum Quarter have been turned into something else, but yet Sursum Quarter is still remaining, standing there. Uh, it's one of the few project communities in this city that the tenants actually have some vested interest in, and that's why it's still remaining. But the story of um, Tinka in this book is about how she leaves her Trinidad neighborhood and is forced to live in Sursum Quarter. She doesn't like it in the beginning because everything that she knows has been flipped upside down. But because her mom loses her job, they are moving in um, with her best friend who happens to live in Sursum Quarter. So I want to read this section that actually started off as a short story um, that I edited later. When me and Tavon turned the corner on Hallbrook Street, 
we saw a whole bunch of swollen plastic bags filled with our shoes, coats, and clothes, and some still on hangers sitting on the sidewalk like trash in front of our building. Two big boxes spilling over with more clothes leaned up against our old green chair the grandma left us before she died. Some bags sat on the worn out wooden, wooden futon mommy found outside that she made Marquan and Tabon drag in the house late one night. Broken glass from picture frames and dishes was sprinkled around like party specks. Man, it's some BS, Tabon said as he stood in front of our stuff. Mommy's mattress with all the stains and bent springs poking through was the only bed out there standing up against the tree. I couldn't help but wonder where the other bed was, beds was, especially my princess dresser set. I loved it. Even though the whole thing was old, mommy got it after one of her bosses died and his daughter told her she could have it if somebody came to pick it up. Two chairs that went with the glass dining room table were still there, but I ain't seen no sign of the table or the other two chairs. I heard Talia and Celeste laughing when they walked past us. My cheeks felt wet, so I wiped my face. Marquand's and Tavon's baby pictures sat on top of a box, and an old picture of my daddy hugging mommy was crumpled up on top of the cracked nightstand. Mommy's GED certificate from Job Corps was upside down on the ground, wet and yellowy like a dog peed on it. The white puffy insides from my teddy bears was everywhere. My favorite green dress was ripped and wrapped halfway around the fire hydrant. My favorite book, Denitra Brown, excuse me, Denitra Brown Leaves Town, had a dirty footprint on the front. All of our stuff looked like trash, scattered and picked over. Man, come on, stop crying, Tavon said, snatching my hand. We walked to the payphone on Florida Avenue. He tried to call his father, Teddy, and his grandmother, but got no answer. Then he tried to call Aunt Renee, but she ain't answer either. Come on, Tinker. Mommy should be back soon, he said. We walked back to our apartment building on Harbrook Street and sat on the steps. We sat for a little while, ignoring people staring at us, the fingers that pointed from across the street and the cars driving slow, until we saw Marquand riding up on his bike smoking a cigarette. When did he start smoking? Marquan shook his head like he knew this was going to happen. Ma ain't nowhere to be found, is she? Tavon shook his head. Marquan shook his head, too. He was real mad. Y'all hungry? I nodded. Here, he said, giving Tavon a $10 bill. Go get you some chips or something from the store. We walked down to the corner store on Florida Avenue. By the time we got back to our building, Mommy was there picking through the pile in one of her good suits. She must have had another interview today. She was shaking her head and cursing when we got closer. As soon as she saw us staring at her, she took a deep breath, and then she snapped. Tavon, watch our stuff and make sure don't nobody take nothing. You hear me? This is our stuff, and we ain't giving it away. It all better be here when we get back. Do you hear me? He nodded, and then, he, then she grabbed my hand. We headed to the payphone on Florida Avenue again. Mommy's hands shook a little while she, when she dialed the numbers. She called Aunt Renee first, then Miss Shalia, who answered the phone right away. I could tell Mommy felt a whole lot better when she hung up. Van on his way to get us, she said aloud. We waited for Miss Shalia's boyfriend to come with his company truck. Marquand came over to help us load up, but he was so mad with Mommy about what happened that he ain't right with us over Miss Shalia's. Oh, you really grown now, huh? She said, slamming the door. Don't think this make you a man. I watched Marquand ride his bike up the street before we pulled off. Tavon made me turn around in my seat. Then I wiped my face and looked out the front window. I ain't know why I was crying. I wanted to be a big girl for mommy, but I couldn't help the tears that kept falling. Thank you. Um, at this time, I guess I'll open the floor to questions. Okay, so here's the short version of that story. I self-published a book. I took 5,000 of my own dollars and I sold them any and everywhere. I was really passionate about making sure other, other people read my story. 
and I was able to sell a lot of books doing that. Um, it wasn't moving or happening fast enough for me. I learned about the NYU Publishing Institute. I sold my house and I went to New York and I started on the ground floor as the editorial assistant, doing everything from getting coffee to making copies, all that sort of thing. And I got to meet a lot of people. Um, I learned a lot while I was there because I learned that even my self-published novel was not some commercial type book. And I learned how to, um, I read what was coming in and what was hitting the New York Times bestselling list, and I edited my writing style, and then I pitched my book again to another agent, and then that's how it happened. <laughs> I was wondering, were you always, did you start out um, in urban fiction, or did you want to write other, another genre? So for me, I just wanted to write. I wanted to tell, Terry McMillan inspired me as a child. I love her mama book. That was, I felt like that was me, the main character in that book was me. And I couldn't believe that there were books out there that wasn't about slavery, it wasn't about segregation. It was just about what was happening right now. And I remember being in the eighth grade and saying, oh my God, there are books like this. And I started just writing, writing, writing. I did not know that there was a category called urban fiction until I got pushed into that category. Um, I just thought I was just telling a story about things that were familiar to me. That's an interesting question. I do tell my students that I write, um, and they like knowing that they have a teacher that writes, but I tell them they can't read my books. <laughs> <laughs> um, and when they insist, I tell them they have to have their mom, their parents' permission, and they need to guide them through it, because the stories do tend to be about teenagers, but they're going through very, to me, traumatic situations that is not something that I would feel comfortable seeing a 12-year-old reading without some very um, explicit guidance from a loved one. So have any of your parents read any of those? Yes, they have. They actually <laughs> send their books to school to get autographed. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yeah. So as an English teacher, I think that you should have a diverse um, library. So right now I have my students reading Romeo and Juliet. I have them reading Animal Farm. I have them reading A Long Way Gone by Ishmael Bea. I have them reading the things that I was brought up reading as well. I was sneaking and looking at my mom's library when I was their age. And even though the stuff was explicit, it opened my mind to a lot of things, and it even it just created a hunger in me. Um, I, there are young adult books that aren't as explicit as the ones that I write, so I would encourage a parent to, because a lot of students don't even realize that there are books that aren't just literary that could appeal to them. I actually encourage my students, especially the males, to read graphic novels if they are apprehensive about reading. I just feel strongly that the more that you read, the more that your mind grows. And you're exposed, I always try to expose them to a, a diversity of cultures too. And even as you see in my novels, I try to sneak in elements of, you know, um, things that do with homosexuality. I want them, Africa, I want them to be exposed so that they can at least, for me, knowledge is power. And the more you read, the more you're prepared to make decisions. Um, I, we might have time for one more question. Yes. I'm just wondering what other books have been very inspirational in your life. Um, I like Kalisha Buchanan's Upstate, Mama. I just recently read Winch um, by Dolan Perkins Valdez. Um, I love, let me take that back. I like Toni Morrison. <laughs> there are some of her books that I you know, really appreciate. Some of it is hard for me even to get into. Um, but I do try to diversify what I read. Um, I like Dave Eggers. So I try to, you know, 
be exposed to a lot of different things. All right. I think that's about it. Thank you guys for coming out and listening to me. Again, my novel, Damaged, is being sold in the Barnes & Noble tent, and Silence comes out in two weeks. <laughs> This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.